Always considered on April 3rd with your hosts Pasco Gibson and Julius Picciani. I hope you enjoy. I remember our house, our garage was not closed in and it did not have a concrete floor, so it was just sand in there. And these little white beach mice would get all in there. I think they're uh, protected now, if not just about extinct. Uh But I would catch these things and put one in my pocket and take it to school every day <laughs> oh and sell it for a couple of dollars. <laughs> I hope that's not incriminating myself, but uh, I think the statute of yeah. limitations run out. Yeah, I think you're probably good on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's just uh, one of the things. You know, there were skunks everywhere. Uh, Navarre Beach was pretty, pretty uh, uh, desolate back then. There mm-hmm. wasn't a whole lot here. The closest payphone, if for those who remember what a payphone is, was across the bridge. Uh, so yeah, there was not a whole lot out here. And what brought your parents here? We were from here, several uh, generations from just inland. Okay. When they started leasing lots, residential lots on mm-hmm. Navarre Beach, my father leased one, and it was it was nine of ten lot nine of ten mm-hmm. was our lot that we leased on and built on, and then we built just a simple block terrazzo floor beach house. Mm-hmm. And I lived there off and on throughout my life Mm -hmm. until Hurricane Opal, and I think it was 95. Hurricane Opal destroyed it. It lasted a lot of hurricanes. I remember as a child, Hurricane Camille, super, super big the Gulf was that day. And I remember this. I remember sitting on top of the house as my dad was boarding windows up and whatnot, just how big and angry the Gulf was that Mm -hmm. day. It was was something else. Mm. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of surfing is getting to getting to feel the different moods of the ocean. Right. And you're a fisherman too, so that's you even get another another angle on that. Yeah, I ride waves on a much bigger board most <laughs> of the time for a living. <laughs> um, uh, I, I fish offshore. Mm-hmm. Uh, I run a charter boat and guide service anymore. I've been in the seafood business my entire life. First uh, dollar I ever made was working with my grandfather on his uh, net boat uh, Mm -hmm. in the inland waters here. Stay on the water quite a bit, Mm -hmm. on and near the water quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And can you kind of explain to me, like, personally what that relationship looks like to the ocean or how that feels? Well, it's a really close bond and it's something you can never get away from, Mm -hmm. Uh, no, no matter what it is, no matter if it's simple, simply walking down the beach you know uh it's just something you feel really close and tied to and you have a relationship with it mm-hmm. i could never live inland uh-huh. for any amount it. of time i got depressed <laughs> yeah that's probably what happened to me <laughs> okay and can you tell me maybe your first surf memory or how surfing started to get into your life yeah i started surfing when i was 15 uh right here at navarre pier mm-hmm. i saved some money up and My parents took me to Pensacola to Interlight Surf Shop. It was on 9th Avenue. It was an old yellow house at the time. And I bought a 6-foot, 2-inch Gordon & Smith single fin. And that's what I started learning to surf on. Mm. So you were right after the transition to shortboards. It must have been pretty close. Yes. It was, I was 15. There was a handful of us that surfed here. Most of the guys that surfed here also fished out on the pier and whatnot, mm-hmm. and I, I, too, fished out on the pier a lot. Mm-hmm. We would stay out on the pier for two or three days on end. We would shark fish all night and then fish for king mackerels or whatever was in season through the day, mm-hmm. and uh, we would work at the pier. We would uh, haul the garbage off the pier, bag bait, wash the bathrooms for our pier entrance there, you know, and we'd catch a fish, and they'd cook it in a little restaurant, little, uh, that was a little restaurant, a little beach restaurant, we had it appear there. They would cook it for us to feed us. That was the life, man. So we all started surfing, and when it was rough and all, we would surf, and when it was calm, we would fish. And yeah. Had it made. That sounds pretty good. No need to go to school. <laughs> oh, yeah? Did you play hooky at all? Oh, yeah, I played hooky quite a bit. 
I played hooky one day, waited all day for the uh, winds to switch offshore. Uh-huh. Late that afternoon, after skipping school all day, just sitting around over here, late that afternoon it went offshore, and I remember I paddled out, I caught one wave, and there was some old pilings from an old wooden pier that used to be here. Paddling back out, I hit those pilings and shredded my leg, just a jillion cuts on it, mm-hmm. and had to come back in at the beach. So yeah. I skipped school that day and hung out all day. And got hurt. For one wave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's um, a fond memory. That's one thing I really haven't talked about very much is injuries. Yes. And it seems like it's something, it's unavoidable, it seems like, if you surf long enough. You do. It is unavoidable. I mean, it's like any other activity you're going to do. Mm-hmm. I don't really like to call surfing a sport. It's more of a, a lifestyle and an art, mm-hmm. you know. But, yeah, you, it's it, you're prone to injuries. I tore my knee up a long time ago. I had to have knee surgery on it surfing i'd surf nine days straight which is pretty unreal for the gulf here Mm -hmm. and on the ninth day i tore my knee up that was about 35 years ago i guess oh wow (laughs) so it didn't slow you down at least for long yeah (laughs) but just the other day this last big swell we had i ruptured my eardrum Mm -hmm. and i was just thinking you know wow i'm really really blessed to have not had any injuries here you know Mm -hmm. lately because a lot of us old we're you know we're a bunch of old guys that surf here together and everybody's got aches and pains and and hips and shoulders and you know heart conditions and what have you mm-hmm. but yeah i had a i took a pretty good wipe out that day and uh, i was pushing it a little mud ruptured my eardrum of all things that's right yeah and that that was my first time surfing navarre i was shocked by how shallow and intense that little area felt right right yeah it had some juice that day in fact when i ruptured my eardrum i I had a two-wave hole down Mm -hmm. meaning that i didn't surface for the wave i eat it on and didn't surface till after the next wave it Mm -hmm. went by and my eardrum ruptured and i got real disoriented Mm -hmm. didn't know which way was up Mm -hmm. really that's scary hit bottom twice Mm -hmm. and when i got to the surface had instant pain in in my ear Mm -hmm. so yeah that but I'm good to go now. I've, it's been two weeks, uh-huh. and uh, we just got out of the water. Two weeks, and yeah. <laughs> I just got out of the water. And yeah. Here I am. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we had a pretty nice day. I feel like the Navarre crowd feels different. Like Pensacola crowd's really nice, but Navarre crowd. When I'm in Pensacola, I'm like I'm the only one who sings. I feel like, but I was hearing someone like singing at the top of their lungs. Oh yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. There's no telling. There's, <laughs> you know, everybody's. It's pretty much freedom of expression out uh-huh, there. Uh huh. I like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's a cool crowd. Can you tell me about the evolution of the people that you surfed with are are there people that that you surfed with as a as a youth that you still see now yeah yeah there is some of the guys that we hung out and surfed with regular a lot of them have stopped surfing but still see them they still fish on the pier they still fish in boats and whatnot and we mm-hmm. talk there are surfers that i grew up surfing with older people especially like brenda and charlie mm-hmm. uh, charlie was sort of the godfather here whenever i was uh, a young kid and he would scold us for not Catching waves, not taking off <laughs> Charlie on Schuller? waves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would. Uh, well, he was a good. He 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 gave us a lot of guidance. And was surfing something that you ever took like competitively? Was that something that you ever? No, competed I in? never pursued it competitively. Mm-hmm. I did surf in a contest or two, but it it, it just didn't appeal to me. Uh huh. Didn't ever do good in them I, for whatever reason. So no, I never went that route. I do like to competitive fish. Uh-huh. Fishing a lot of tournaments and whatnot, captain some big sport fishing yachts and whatnot, and some blue marlin tournaments and whatnot. But it's funny because you were just calling it not a sport, an art. And what was the other thing that you said? A uh, lifestyle. A lifestyle, yeah. And I think I identify more with those parts of it. Right. Uh, now, I keep up with, I, you know, I'm not knocking competitive surfing. I mean, I think it's great that, mm-hmm. that it's getting the recognition that it does today mm-hmm. more so than it ever has. Yeah. But it's just not for me, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I recently saw, I think it's like Tika Poo. Tika, how do I say that? Chopu. Chopu, thank you. Chopu, they were talking about the Olympics or something is going to be held there. And then they're going to like maybe damage the reef to put like. Oh, my goodness. The, the, yeah. Have you heard any of this? No, no, <laughs> okay. Anyway, but I, I, that was tying in because before we were recording, you were mentioning about water quality. And we were talking about 
it kind of like this theme of being stewards kind of came up in Charlie Schuler's interview. And can you talk to me a little bit about how sure. you see yourself kind of as a steward? Well, being a fisherman, I've, I've made my living, raised my kids from, from fishing and off the, our waters and mm-hmm. waterways and waterfront. Yeah. So it's very important to me. Commercial fishermen, a lot of times, get a bad rap. for Their real hardcore commercial fishermen are concerned about the environment more than you realize. Yeah. And we, we're having some really important water quality issues in our local area as we speak here. Mm-hmm. I was big in the oyster business, and we produced a lot of oysters out of our waterways here, our bays. In recent years, they're all but vanished. Mm-hmm. And it's not from overfishing. It's from overdevelopment, mm-hmm. runoff, and lack of infrastructure in place allowing the development on our waterfront and, and close to the waterfront. Mm-hmm. Here recently, within the last year, a large, large portion of our bay where we used to harvest oysters commercially has been closed to any harvest because of continuous high fecal counts. Mm. A large portion of East Bay, a large portion of Blackwater Bay, and a large portion of Escambia Bay have been closed. And within this past year, due to this high fecal count by the Department of Agriculture, who continuously monitors our bays, they have the best data, and they've been doing it for years and years and years. They've been doing it as long as I really remember. Mm -hmm. So they have a database to support this. It's tremendous. Mm -hmm. And what's causing this is lack of infrastructure. We're experiencing a a explosion of development in our area, Mm -hmm. and the infrastructure is not there to support it, whether it be runoff from developers coming in and cutting all the forest down Mm -hmm. and not, not leaving anything so it's all running off to no sewer system in place. And that's a biggie with me because that is directly affecting our waters, mm-hmm. our qua- water quality. Right. So now you've got them sh- shutting the oysters down, the no, no harvest. The next thing you know, there'll be no fish consumption mm-hmm. if, it, if something's not done about it. Yeah. And the next thing you know, there'll be no water sports mm-hmm. going on in them areas. And the areas will probably expand. So, yeah, it's a, it, and I feel like government has been a poor steward of our natural resources, which in this area, it's our biggest draw. Right, yeah. I mean, that's why do you think these people are moving here? Yeah, you know? it's either the military industrial complex or this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful area, and mm-hmm. it has a lot of re- natural resources. Yeah. It, it's getting slowly, slowly messed up. Mm-hmm. We really need to get sewer systems in place. The, the The building needs to be slowed down by stop giving out so many building permits, mm-hmm. stop the development until we can get some infrastructure in place to support it. Mm-hmm. What they're permitting now for septic tanks, I can take and show you, you know, septic tanks that have been installed within the last couple of years on or near the water leaching out into our bay. Gotcha. Okay. So... Mm-hmm. You know, we need sewer systems in place. We need stormwater runoff in place, mm-hmm. uh, or else we're going we're going to have a real problem down the road with our waters. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like it's a delicate balance because I know you've also been a business owner. Yeah, I guess you've many businesses, really. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's like a balance between we want development, you want growth, but at the same time you want to protect what we have. Well, you want planned growth. Mm-hmm. You don't want to just free for all moving in here, selling every piece of property, clear cutting everything. Uh-huh. Yeah, you can build. Here's your permit. Here's your permit. You know, give me the money. Mm-hmm. That sort of approach to it. Yeah, it needs to be planned, and the infrastructure. I go back to that. It needs to be in place mm-hmm. to support the growth. Yeah, yeah. I've been in, in seafood business all my life. Like I said, mm-hmm. the first time I met you, you told me a really great story. You told me that uh, Nathan Pooley's first job was working for you at a seafood restaurant. That's absolutely right. <laughs> We live right down, right across the highway from us there. Uh, uh, my restaurant and fish house and all were, was, is down on the bay in the boondocks. And he would walk to work <laughs> over there. Uh, he, he ended up being a fry cook there. And, uh, yeah. So That's <laughs> funny. We, have, we, have, we, go, we go back quite a while. Yeah, Nathan's a, a big part of the, our Pensacola scene. <laughs> yeah, he's my <laughs> pastor, actually. Is he? Oh, you go to... Upper uh, Room Church. Upper Room Church. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You make the drive over for the quality. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, always, it's always good that you gave your pastor his first job. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. And, and I've known his family all my life. Mm-hmm. His family is from the little area of Baghdad that, I've, mm-hmm. that my family's from, really. Or, so we've, we go way back. Mm. Can you tell me some surf stories? Just... just 
a- anything, any memories that pop up to you, things that happened, things that didn't even happen to happen to you, anything? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm sure I can come up with some. Uh, <laughs> one day, it was, it, this was a, one of the biggest days I remember seeing Navarre Beach that was surfable. Uh-huh. Uh, big, huge, offshore days. And it was quite a while back. It was probably around... I don't know, late 70s or something. Me and my buddy pulled up in the parking lot at the pier here pretty early. uh, It was Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, Nice. Uh, (laughs) Priorities. There was only one, yeah, there was only one car in the parking lot, and it was Charlie Shuler's little MG Midget. Okay, cool. I think that's what it was. And we couldn't find him anywhere. Yeah. And we watched and watched, and I mean, it was huge that day. And the old pier, the pier before the pier that's here now, had a big T on the end of it. And we sat there for probably 20 minutes. You know, it was way too big. We weren't, we weren't fixing to paddle out there. We sat there for 20 minutes, probably, looking for Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we see him taking off on a wave past the end of the pier. The end of the pier was a quarter mile. The yeah. pier was a quarter mile long. He took off on this wave past the end of the pier and shot the T on the end of the pier. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was, we just went crazy. <laughs> it was phenomenal. <laughs> uh, so, th- you know, that that's something I'll never forget. A kind of a, one of the biggest, gnarliest, but clean day that I remember here. So did you then get in the water or were you just We, waited, we went out later okay. on the day. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, it fell off as it does here, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> it did fall off to a manageable size there mm-hmm. a little later, mid-morning or something. Because Charlie didn't move to Pensacola till a little bit later, right? Because he was basically Fort Walton Beach, Navarre area, well, they, right? Well, yeah, I'm not sure what year. that They, they lived right across the bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he had a younger brother that I was good friends with. That's right. He had mentioned that. A Freddie uh, Peanut, Peanut. Shuler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were living over there in the late 70s, I know. Mm-hmm. And Can you tell me about Peanut? Yeah, Peanut was a gung-ho, hardcore surfer. He, he would go to the North Shore of Oahu every, uh, every winter. Mm-hmm. He was shooting for becoming a pro surfer, and mm-hmm. uh, he would try to get me to go with him a lot, <laughs> and uh, I just never had the balls or whatever to do it at that point. And you were probably really working, to. too. <laughs> Charlie always told me it was a good thing you didn't yeah. go with him over there. <laughs> uh, Charlie told me, he was telling me this story where his brother was hanging out with Mark Fu and they were in a grocery store and apparently Peanut had pissed off some Hawaiians and they came in the store to grab him and he was trying to get Mark Fu to help him and Mark was like oh no you're good these guys are going to beat you up but they'll res- if you put up a good fight they'll respect you in the lineup or something like that like, oh, that God. sounds about right that sounds about like Peanut <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but- you- go ahead but there was a whole crew of us here. A few names grew up in that era right here. David Broxson, mm. Clifton Wells, Mark Pippin, Peanut. and We just had a good little crew here. Greg Storm, Greg and Chris Storm. And uh, we had a place down the beach here. We would uh, It was like a big bowl in between the dunes there. And we would play football down there. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> uh, and we called it the Mako Bowl. We were all the Makos back then. That was our club or whatever. That was what we called ourselves, uh-huh. the Makos. <laughs> And we would ha- we would play football down there every Sunday or so. so. That's cool. <laughs> that was a yeah, that was a good period. But no no matching jackets ever. No <laughs> no, we didn't we didn't have no money to do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Nobody cared anyway. We, uh-huh. didn't, we didn't see anybody. Like I said, it was it was sparsely populated over here back then. Mm-hmm. There was the pier. There was a motel right next to the pier. And there was a set of apartments on down about, about before the curve in the road, and then there was ten houses, and mm. that was it. Mm. So, char- and a pavilion. There was a big pavilion right here where we're sitting, a big concrete open air pavilion. Mm-hmm. I later uh, worked here as a lifeguard on at this pavilion. That was. I didn't know that part. Okay, so do you remember what year that you lifeguarded in? Yeah, it was r- right around the eighties, early eighties, eighty ish, seventy nine, eighty. Uh, 81. I did it for several years. I lived down the beach and would just ride my bike to work down here. Uh-huh. I didn't have a vehicle at the time, one of, them, one of those years. My mom or would come get me once a week and take me to the grocery store and bring me back to the beach and dump me off. <laughs> and uh, I had a bicycle. I rode back and forth. <laughs> 
to work, <laughs> we shark fished off the beach behind my house every night. Mm-hmm. That was our entertainment. We'd get all the tourists down there around where we were shark fishing, and that was our entertainment, you know. <laughs> that was a life, man. <laughs> yeah, you sound like you were had an all-inclusive beach life in Navarre. <laughs> I did. I really did. It, I really did. I was very, very blessed to, to, to grow up like this, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was telling my son, back some time ago uh, about how we would stay on the pier there for two or three days through the winter and nobody was over here in the winter we'd get dropped off over here the pier wasn't open we'd climb on it we'd stay out there a couple of days you know and he could not fathom that we could come stay that, that our parents would let us first of all that we could come stay on that pier without a cell phone uh-huh. <laughs> yeah i'm like son <laughs> cell phones wasn't even developed till after you were born uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, you're literally having the restaurant cook your fish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was in the winter. The restaurant wasn't even open. Uh-huh. We had to walk back across the bridge to the store to get something to eat if we didn't have it with us. So what, did you have sleeping bags? Oh, yeah, t- we yeah. slept on the pier in sleeping bags <laughs> through the winter. Great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One, one day we had gotten dropped off over here, and it was in early March, mm-hmm. and there was nobody over here. It was four of us kids. None of us had driver's license. So one of our moms had dropped us all off here. We were going to shark fish that night on the pier. We had to catch some bait. We had no bait. So I had caught a, a bait and was reeling it up, and my buddy was going to come gaff it for us so we could make sure we got it up mm-hmm. on the piers because we needed it desperately for bait. Well, he's running down the pier with a gaff, and the rope's dragging behind him. Well, the rope caught in a crack and snatched that gaff through his arm through his wrist Holy from all the way through it he walked up to me and said look what i've done oh, God. <laughs> just as nonchalantly as I, I said well pull it out he snatched it out and luckily it didn't bleed or anything just a plug of meat kind of come out oh, of God. it anyway we had no way of going anywhere mm-hmm. so we stayed on the pier that night you know and i caught a shark that night i ate foot <laughs> two shark the next morning we got him to the old man that opened the pier up come the next morning and he gave him a ride loaded him up and took him back across the bridge and called somebody to come get him (laughs) and uh so that was kind of adventures we had back then that's great this sounds like this sounds like some uh tom sawyer it was exactly what we were on the beach it was the beach version of huckleberry finn yeah (laughs) i love that yeah yeah a couple little pretty much redneck beach boys Uh (laughs) yeah Can you think of some memories as you started to get older and you started to start seeing younger surfers underneath you? Can you think of any memories from that time period? Sure. During high school, I went to Milton to high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, That was the nearest high school back then. There was some, as I guess was a senior or whatever, there was two surfers in my graduating class, me and another guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, His name was Jimmy Campbell. He and I, he surfed Pensacola Beach and I surfed down at Navarre. There was a couple of of younger guys that, that would show up to the beach, you know, and there ended up being a handful of them that, that really got into surfing, you know, and they did really good. We called them the Groms, you know. Uh-huh. They ended up coming in the VAR and, and surfing and uh, progressed, and, and, and some of them got pretty good. That's great. And was there any an- animosity in the beginning, or what no, was that process no, like? No, no, not at all, really. Uh, you were happy to see other people surf. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. Now, we were pretty localized back then. Uh, mm-hmm. We didn't like a lot of people from from out of the area coming to our break here uh-huh. and surfing yeah, because okay. localism was a big thing back then, uh-huh. kind of, you know. So uh, uh, one of our guys, one of our buddies here was a, a pretty burly dude, you know, and he was pretty intimidating. So he would, you know, if you weren't from here, he'd paddle up to you in the lineup and intimidate you a little <laughs> bit till you left. <laughs> till you left, okay. <laughs> that was David Broxon. Was his name. <laughs> <laughs> He's still around today. I saw him down the pier just the other day. <laughs> And so that seems like it's something that's changed because right now, uh, you know, it has. Everybody's mellowed out and, uh-huh. and and you know get plenty of waves. It was just a thing, you know, young kids trying to be tough, I guess. Uh huh. And, and so, so someone was talking to me like there's this balance between you want new surfers and I guess existing surfers to behave by a certain set of unsaid and said rules. Right, right. It, and you know, you, the young surfers do need to, to you know, to, to pick up on the etiquette factor of surf. 
because mm-hmm. it is very important for safety, for mm-hmm. camaraderie, just in general, you know, yeah. just to make the whole experience that much more enjoyable. Exactly. Yeah. And it seems like now, it seems like like back in the day, people were too intense about enforcement. And now it seems like maybe there's less enforcement and it's... it's That's probably so, especially here. Because uh, now we have, I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, females in the lineup, mm-hmm. more so than ever. Back when I was young and Navarre Beach was young, I guess, uh-huh. the only female surfer here was Brenda Stokes. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So that I think that causes the lineup to really mellow out a lot too. Uh-huh. the calming presence of women right yeah. <laughs> thank god <laughs> <laughs> thanks brenda <laughs> that's right you started it <laughs> that's funny uh what's the age difference between you and brenda how old are you i am 63 63 okay i want to say brenda's 69 right yeah now. she's okay. a little older than me mm-hmm. she was a lifeguard on navarre beach at one time here, uh, I think Charlie drug her off down to Pensacola Beach. That's right. Yep. But I was I was a lifeguard after she was. Mm-hmm. I think there was one guy that was between us there, Leo Pullum. He was between Brenda and Brenda's tincture and my tincture here. Okay. On the beach, but it was it was a really cool place to work here. Uh, mm-hmm. The pavilion was here. There was a little food court there, a gift shop, a bar. You had your moments here. You know, it was another one of them things that was pretty entertaining. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a <laughs> yeah, lot of fun. it was. It was a lot of fun back. There was no law enforcement on this beach whatsoever <laughs> back then, so it was like the wild wild west. Uh, did you guys ever get into any kind of trouble? Not really. <laughs> Okay. Not really. You don't, not you don't have any that, bad stories. You no, can share nothing that really. I mean, the kind of trouble we would get into would be you your know, friend having a gaff through his. Yeah, arm. that kind of thing. Adventuresome <laughs> trouble. Yeah, uh-huh, uh, yeah. You know, paddle, go out fishing in a in a John boat out here offshore, and the north wind come up and blow hard, and it, you had the dickens of a time to get Getting back, back in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Paddling so, a shark bait out and yeah. <laughs> canoe tip over or something. But yeah, it was it was trouble, but you learned how to deal with it and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys sounded very self-sufficient. Yeah, we were. We were. We figured stuff out ourselves. Uh-huh. I'm curious, is there something that you wish I'd asked you? We talked about the environment. I really wanted to touch on that. Mm-hmm. I just would really like to thank my Savior, Jesus Christ, for letting me experience this life that I have uh-huh. here, you know. And I hope that uh, that I've been a good steward of what he has, has embedded me to, to be able to participate in. Mm-hmm. One thing that I am very, very truly thankful for, because it's not going to be many more generations that things like the oysters are going to be all gone. Mm-hmm. Once you get to a point, there's no, tr- no, there's no correcting it, you mm-hmm. know. And the wildlife, fishes we have, some of that's already disappeared. Mm-hmm. Horseshoe crabs you never see anymore. As I was a kid running around over in the sound, there was horseshoe crabs everywhere. Seahorses, mm-hmm. you never see a seahorse anymore. Mm-mm. I'm real very grateful that I was able to experience a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do feel like, uh, from knowing you for a short amount of time, I feel like you do seem to be a good, I hate to always overuse the word steward, but it seems like, you know, people yeah. people like you, and you, se- you seem like you're a good presence here. Well, I, I, I've tried to convey the message, you know, the best mm-hmm. I can to our powers that be, our county commissioners, mm-hmm. uh, our different civic groups and whatnot, to get everybody on board with, with what's going on here. Because mm-hmm. it's not really good whenever they close large portions of the bay to continuous high fecal counts that's right. their exact words mm-hmm. uh, i have a good relationship with the department of agriculture and the the ladies down there that, that do all the studies and whatnot and the sampling and all and they keep me pretty much posted on what's going on mm-hmm. do you have a last favorite story or memory or wave <laughs> or anything like that uh let me think a minute <laughs> well i can tell you one here i was a really young kid we live, like I said, we were living down the beach here. My dad would take the little skiff, little r- skiff, and and no motor or anything, and would go out fishing in it. He and somebody, a buddy or somebody he had with him, went out fishing one day, and like the hard, uh, thunderstorm come through, and the wind just picked up and gassed out of the north, mm-hmm. super hard. We could watch them through binoculars at the house, and they were getting further and further offshore. My Mom, we had another boat in the garage, but there was no way to launch it on just the beach. Mm-hmm. Well, right down a few houses down the beach there, right in the curve of the road, was the Gills. Uh, they, a family called, or people called the Gills, mm-hmm. Bubba Gills, who it was, matter of fact. And they were having a party there that night. And I was a little bitty feller, you know, probably, I don't know, eight or nine years old. Well, Mom went down there and got all these guys there, and they picked that <laughs> boat up and toted it down on the beach. It's slick calm yeah. on the beach. <laughs> 
toted it down on the beach. They cranked the motor up, and they run out there and got my dad yeah. and his buddy and brought them back in. And it was just a hoot for them to do. You know? <laughs> yeah. It sounds like, I mean, if you're at a party and you're drunk with a bunch of your friends, carrying a boat sounds like a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was something there. That was that was a, a memory I'll never forget anyway. And my dad was mad at him because he might have got back in eventually. Yeah. <laughs> your mom was taking care of business. Yeah. She was panicking. <laughs> Thank you. That was some Stevie Ray. All right, we're going to play an original song. This is called When I Cross That Line. It just came out, I think, last week. But uh, you can find all of our stuff on Spotify, and we got a website and Instagram. Anyway, thank you all.
Thanks for watching Always Considered. I'm your host, Pasco Gibson. Goodbye. Beautiful. <laughs>